From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 160, recorded on October 9th, 2018. Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today here in New York City is Dixon Depommier. Hello there, Vincent. And remotely, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hello there, Daniel. <laughs> How are we all doing today? Is everyone chipper and fine? I think so. Dixon, doing, go ahead, I'm Daniel. doing great. I'm doing great. Great. Yeah, me too. Me too, actually. Interesting day. Very. It's, you know, it still feels like summer outside. It's very humid. It is. And that's so warm. It's in the 70s. It's going to be more humid when the hurricane brings all that moisture up. There's a hurricane coming? There is. Well, it's too bad. When is hurricane season over? When flu season starts? When it stops. <laughs> Daniel, did you know that last flu season, 80,000 Americans died? I've been um, making sure to spread that number around because um, I— I find it worrisome. I mean, 80,000 people, that's a lot of people. That, that's that's a lot of people. And that's that's the U.S. alone. And uh, I was making a comment uh, to one of the students I was teaching this morning, is that there is this uh, this thought that a lot of people uh, use to generate complacency where they say, you know, those people are going to die anyway. And I'm like, you know, usually. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, all of us I are going to die anyway. I mean, right? Yes. Oh. Yeah, and it, it, <laughs> It's in a ridiculous. sense, yes. But uh, no, normally in the U.S. we lose in a normal flu year, an average flu year perhaps I should say, ten to 20,000 um, mm-hmm. excess deaths that are directly attributed to influenza. Now, I guess the assumption has to be there was an extra 60 this year that were just sort of ready to be called or something. But no, <laughs> no, actually. <laughs> no, um, no, actually is right. <laughs> no, the, these are people that if – if our society would embrace vaccination with a little more vigor and zest, yeah, yeah. Um, we would see a lot less death. So I hate when I see numbers, which I'm sure will come out soon, where they say, oh, the influenza vaccination is only 30 percent effective or 50 percent, whatever number they like to throw out there. And what I, what I like to point out is, OK, all that number means is that people who get vaccinated are such and such percent less likely to go seek medical attention. But what really matters is not, OK, I got the flu. I feel sick enough. I want to see somebody. What really matters, I guess I would say to me, is I didn't die. And the flu vaccination yeah. for individuals and for society have a huge impact on the number of people that die each winter. And whether that's mm. for selfish reasons, you say, I was vaccinated, I'm less likely to die. Or because you, you may have friends and family that you care about, where you say, my friends and family and my parents and my relatives and my children are less likely to die because we all embraced vaccination. You're not and talking it's a, about herd immunity by any chance, are you? <laughs> it, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yeah. Apparently they haven't heard you. <laughs> <laughs> I like. That. Well, also we're talking about the actual immunity in you, not right. just that the herd. Of course, of course. That'll help you too. And I would bet that it. I would bet that a good fraction of those eighty thousand were not immunized against right. influenza. That's exactly right. Well, no, the, the majority, I think, and I, I wish they would play that up a little more and say that you know the the people of these eighty thousand that died, this is the number that were yeah. you know yeah. that were not vaccinated with the percentage. So they don't yes. post that number. Yes. No, they don't. Well, this um, this this podcast deals with a parasite, but larger eukaryotic parasites than viruses, and um, there are no vaccines, are there? against any of the parasites we discuss. Well, if you consider a scarification as a vaccination procedure, then for leishmania, you, you probably You can scarify, do. yeah. You can, for, for the dermal form, but not for the visceral. Huh. Where do they do that? Well, they do that mostly in the Middle East mm. and in Russia. Russia had a big program for that at one point. Which, I don't know if they still do it, as a matter of fact, but it's possible. That's to how do it you that deliver way. smallpox vaccine. Exactly. For scarification. Exactly. So. Exactly. Exactly. But it's only good against the, the dermal. That's right. It's not against the visceral or the mucocutaneous. Which are the most serious. Of course. All right. Before we begin with our case from last week, we have two follow up emails. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think, Daniel, you could take that first one from Jim. Oh, certainly. Jim writes. Thanks to you all for this interesting case study with its guesses. I enjoyed the complicated story in this highly functioning person. 
it was interesting to me that a lot of the psychiatric comments seemed to come out of psychiatric theory that was prevalent in the 1970s. <laughs> The 1970s in psychiatry. Uh, he's criticizing you, Dixon, by the way. But anyway, I'm the sure. 1970s in, <laughs> and psych rightly so. in psychiatry were a time of transition from psychoanalytic thinking to a more biological approach to um, psychiatry disorders. Old ways of approaching psychiatric problems persist as newer methods are adopted, but progress is being made. Terms like folly adieu and matchbox presentations of evidence were used as evidence of psychiatric disorders in this case discussion. It is not clear that findings like this have any relevance in modern psychiatry. This patient may be experiencing anxiety more than delusions. He seems to have some substance use problems and some post-traumatic problems. This guy needs a psychiatric consult. There are a lot of references to delusions, post-traumatic disorder, and substance use disorder. These terms were used like they were already understood. The assumption seems to be that these terms were self-evident and that precise definitions were not needed. Clearer definitions, according to modern psychiatry, would be helpful. Daniel's sympathetic approach seems to be working at least partially with this patient. Mm -hmm. A consultation with psychiatry does not necessarily have to involve the reluctant patient at the beginning. For patients who cannot initially tolerate the idea, treating the treating physician can get ideas of how to keep things moving to resolve the problems mentioned above. For patients who are more tolerant of a psychiatric evaluation, more direct work can begin. This may be a very good case to have a psychiatrist join the TWIP team in discussing the case. I would love to hear about how modern psychiatry sees this patient. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the TWIP team and to all the TWIX podcasts. Hmm. It would be interesting to have a psychiatrist weigh in. Now, this patient did not have a psychiatric consult, right, Daniel? He was, uh, as I guess suggested by this emailer, he was he was the reluctant patient. He was not not tolerant of the idea, and actually, that was hmm. that was what brought him, I think, to me and away from other doctors. Is that whenever he would be seen, people would, and, and I think in a disparaging way, say, you know, this is all in your head. You're crazy. Hmm. Um, and he felt that we're not actually listening to him. He was not being heard, and so he would switch. But I, I appreciate um, Jim writing this because this is very challenging um, when a patient comes to see an infectious disease doctor whose specialty is not psychiatry mm -hmm. um, with an issue that may very well be um, more appropriate for the care of a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if you happen to run into any, let them know they can come on the show and talk about it. Right, which reminds me of the worst joke I ever told, and I'll tell it anyway. A man runs into a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist says, oof. <laughs> okay. That actually, I do know a good psychiatrist. I, I do know. <laughs> one. He, he actually probably would be willing to come on our show, too. So he, I might um, get in touch with him. Speaking of that, uh, someone recommended a podcast to me, and it's called. It's produced by Genentech. Oh. Um, and it's called Two Scientists Walk Into a Bar." <laughs> it's just not a good title because they never do, right? Remember what I told you when I walked in before? <laughs> Two scientists walk into an error bar. <laughs> That's very good, actually. I like that. Uh, thank you. That should be the name of the podcast. I'm here Wednesdays. Try the veal. One more follow-up from Alex. Hello, all. I want to start with saying that I'm not a parasitologist, but the way that your podcast is hosted <laughs> makes it so easy to want to learn more. That's perfect. Hosted. Yes, we got it. I knew as I was growing up that I wanted to work outside. I just didn't know what I could do. Going to college for a degree in natural resources and later learning about oceanography has made me want mm -hmm. to go further and learn more and hopefully in the future help others gain a better understanding of the sciences. I feel that as it stands, I wouldn't really have a serious need for a hardcover edition of Parasitic Diseases. Currently, my college is growing a lot. We recently got our first three bachelor's programs, and I feel that I want to give the book to them in hopes there might be a better opportunity for a student to find a topic that they might be interested in. That's Thank you, generous. Alexander, who won the book last week. Got it. So he wants to give it to his library. It's just totally That's fine. That's great. We Absolutely. will send it to you, and you can hand it to your library. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Alex and Jim. And now for our case. The drums are rolling. <laughs> Daniel. 
<laughs> okay. For everybody uh, tuning in, tuning back in, and for those tuning in for the first time, uh, in our last TWIP, we presented a uh, case um, where we had gone back to India, and we're seeing a gentleman in his 20s. Uh, we're seeing him during the rainy season in, in southern India. And uh, he, he comes in with a week of feeling generally achy, malaise, uh, reporting fever and measured fever. He has pain in the right, right upper part of his belly. He reports some vomiting, but no diarrhea. He tells us that he's married, has no children, uh, and that he works indoor in the trades, actually an electrician. He does tell us that he uh, drinks a large amount of palm date liquor. Um, but prior to this, he's been healthy with no allergies, no medical issues, and he doesn't travel. He just stays in this um, local area of southern India. Hmm. Um, on exam, we noticed that uh, the right lung base had decreased breath sounds. Um, and then in the upper right quadrant of the abdomen, you can actually feel um, the liver below the costal margin. And I noticed that he had the intercostal sign, that if you actually put your fingers between the ribs, there's point tenderness between the ribs as you push in. Mm. Um, he had an elevated white count with a left shift. He had our, our described eosinopenia, so the eosinophils had cleared. Um, his alkaline phosphatase was elevated. Um, a chest x-ray had shown a, an effusion. So this is fluid around the lung um, in the right base, but no, no lesion in the lung itself. Um, and an ultrasound of the liver was done, and this sh showed a fluid-filled um, single lesion, and the lesion was aspirated. That's how we left it. We That's did. how we left it. We I did. think I gave size. I think I said that this was um, about the size of a, of a tennis ball. It was sort of right. an eight by five by seven centimeter, simple fluid filled um, lesion. Dixon, can you take that first email, please? I can, and it's it's a it's an extraordinary email, and thank you for giving it to me. See, I am nice to you. You are. Caitlin writes, <laughs> dear Twiplets, <clears throat> the electrician from Tamil Nadu had a liver mass, which could be caused by several parasitic and non-parasitic causes. With the help of the handy Bible, Parasitic Diseases, 6th edition, we came up with a differential diagnosis. First, Echinococcus granulosus is well known to cause liver cysts. However, it would normally cause jaundice, which the patient did not have. It is also usually asymptomatic, and if symptomatic causes and if symptomatic, causes less dramatic symptoms and less ruptured. The patient also did not report contact with dogs and sheep. Furthermore, we would not expect the doctor to aspirate a suspected hydatid cyst since puncturing it would be dangerous. Another possibility is Ascaris lumbricoides. It sometimes ends up in the liver and causes an abscess, as has been known to happen in the list uh, reference there, and can be confused with a cyst formed by E. histolytica, another reference. It can be diagnosed using ultrasound or by aspirating the lesion. This infection is endemic to the area and consistent with most of the other symptoms, such as pain and fever. However, an ascaris infection would cause eosinophilia, which makes this less likely. If this was the infection, treatment would be albendazole and likely surgery. Entamoeba histolytica usually causes amoebic dysentery, but nearly half of cases of extraintestinal infection have no symptoms of colonic infection. Symptoms associated with an amoebic liver cyst are uh, right upper abdominal pain with enlarged liver and intercostal tenderness plus fever. Check. No eosinophilia, often eosinopenia. Check. Lung involvement is most commonly spread directly from the liver and affects the base of the right lung. Pearl effusions is a likely symptom. Check. The only symptom that doesn't completely fit is the nausea and vomiting, but that's common with illnesses in general and maybe psychosomatic, pain-related, unrelated, or alcohol-related, although in the last case, the patient would probably know what caused it. It is also logically plausible that he got an eosolytic infection during the ordinary course of his life. It is found worldwide and transmission is fecal-oral, which is likely to happen if the general sanitation and hygiene are not great. If not in his house, as his wife is unaffected, perhaps in his client's Transmission via soil is also likely. Aspiration of the lesion is common, both diagnostically and as a treatment. 
The patient should be given metronidazole and should stop drinking at least for the duration of the treatment. Of course, we should mention the possibility of non-parasitic liver cysts. Those seem to be usually benign congenital cysts with no symptoms, not likely in this case even as an incidental finding alongside an infection. The pain comes from that area, and they tend to be smaller. Some cystic tumors may occur in the liver, but these don't explain all the symptoms and are unlikely to appear as a 7 times 8 times 3 centimeter tumor after only a week's illness. Also, this is TWIP, so we're expecting a parasitic diagnosis. We're both happy with the PDF, so if we win the book, please send it to someone completely random and mystify them. <laughs> <laughs> this is a transatlantic collaborative effort between Caitlin from Waterloo in Canada and Carrie from Newcastle upon Tyne, England. How any, nice. You mean any person randomly in the world or a listener, a random listener? They'll have to give us another email for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, our, think it's our, the, I think it's a random non-listener, so they're just shocked. Why did this book show up in my mail? <laughs> yeah. We could say we could include a link to the podcast. We could do that. Daniel, can you take the next one? Certainly. Adam Ripes. Hi, all. My guess on the case in TWIP 159 is an abscess caused by Entamoeba histolytica. My reasons for this is that it was the first thing I came to think of, and I don't have time to do any proper research. <laughs> okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Echinococcus granulosis can also cause fluid-filled lesions in the liver, but I don't think the clinical presentation fits, and also I'm not sure if it's present in southern India. You don't need to read this, and I know I've asked this before, but a brief summary of the paper discussed in each episode with the most important findings and its implications would be really appreciate it. Um, you know, we've had that before. Uh, we have it. You're right. We keep an forgetting. executive summary. So we'll do that. We'll remember this time. And we will all be thanks to Adam who writes to us from Halmstead, Sweden. Indeed. 12 degrees C. Huh? Yeah. With wind. Chilly. Indeed. David writes, hail twiplets. Good afternoon from Perth, Washington. Showery 17 degrees. Western Australia. Western Australia. Yeah, Perth is Australian, but then the <laughs> WA kind of threw me. Right. I've been listening to the Twixes since the beginning, but find the virology and microbiology sometimes inaccessible. However, the parasitology is absolutely fascinating. I'm a retired electrical electronic person, but a biomedical enthusiast. When I was age 14 and attending a good grammar school in UK, I was in the science stream, but was forced to make a choice between physical sciences and life sciences, and I may have chosen the wrong one. School biology in those days was cutting up frogs and a bit of taxonomy and didn't seem very interesting. This was before the DNA revolution. A few years ago, I had some immunological issues, and in order to try and understand what was going on, I studied a bit and read Bruce Alberts. Hmm. That's a big Great book. Great textbook, The Microbiology of the Cell from Cover to Cover, while on a long course of prednisone, which reduced my need for sleep to three hours. <laughs> Not being able to compete with the qualified people who normally respond to the diagnostic challenges. I normally don't think about them, but I thought I would have a go this time and suggest the gentleman has one or more hydatid cysts caused by echinococcus granulosis. I love the style of presentation that you have achieved that does not talk down to the audience but remains accessible to a general but scientifically literate listenership. Nice. Best regards. Thanks for the work you put in. Dixon. Adel writes, Dear professors, now that the episode is out, and I wanted to, clar as I, I wanted to clarify some points. Firstly, I am male. Secondly, thank you so much for inadvertently giving me two shots and a book off a single submission, and doing so <laughs> during a case where my last guess was not so unreasonable as to make me look totally out to sea. I hope this next one is better and allows me to win without the need for you to extend any unique kindness to me again. Now for my next guess. The literature I initially reviewed indicated that the parasite in the region of interest to consider are coccidia, strongyles, monesia, and trichuris. The key symptoms for me, however, were the vomiting without diarrhea, the lesion in the liver, the decreased breath sounds, and the hepatomegaly. Consequently, Econococcus seemed like a stronger option. I believe you mentioned dogs in the proximity, and looking to my own experience visiting family in India, can certainly see how Econococcus could easily be present. In addition, Econococcus is known to have the potential to infect lungs and cause cysts in the liver. 
given that vomiting is particularly associated with hepatic sequelae of conococcosis, underscores the potential for this being correct. In addition, it is additionally known this organism has the potential to increase alkaline phosphatase, though the patient's heavy drinking may be partly responsible for abnormal liver function, abnormal liver function tests, uh, test results as well. All this in conjunction with your saying this was a relatively straightforward case makes me feel reasonably comfortable about this guess. Uh, beware the straightforward case. Exactly. <laughs> Daniel, can you take Kevin's? Uh, Kevin writes, man in his 20s with a liver mass lives in southern India, drinks the toddy palm wine, perhaps to excess, it's the rainy season, has a big liver, right pulmonary effusion, right intercostal tenderness, eight centimeter solitary cystic liver mass on ultrasound. Dr. G has left us many breadcrumbs on the trail. I first learned about palm wine on TWIF in the context of the <laughs> Nipah virus transmission. Right. It is consumed throughout the tropical world, and many different types of palm trees can produce the beverage. In southern India and Sri Lanka, it can be called toddy and usually contains between 4 to 7% alcohol, much like American beer. The people who gather the palm sap are called toddy tappers, a pleasing occupational title. More on this later. Best to begin with an examination of what this lesion most likely is not. Tropical hepatic abscesses may be due to, one, bacterial or pyogenic. I would expect patient to be sicker, almost septic if he had this. Uh, unique sonographic features may be reviewed in the Bachelor reference. The usual culprit is Klebsiella pneumoniae. Two, tuberculosis. Always think TB. It is a great imitator. <laughs> Only 7.5% of nauseous series had this. Fungal, very uncommon. Nosh 2014 case series of 200 patients. Only 1.5% had fungal abscess candidate in it. Miscellaneous, culture negative, indeterminate malignancy. Five, parasitic helminthic. Hydatid cyst is a concern. It is usually associated with eosinophilia which is inconsistent with our patient who is eosinopenic. Hydatid cysts often have unique sonographic features which distinguish them from other types of abscess. One of the highest prevalence locations of echinococcus in India is in Tamil Nadu. He gives us a reference there where our patient lives. Classic teaching forbade aspiration of these lesions for fear of cyst rupture and subsequent intra-abdominal daughter cyst formation. However, recent thinking is that hydatid cysts can be safely drained percutaneously, gives a Polat reference. Our patient's laboratory and radiograph data make this diagnosis unlikely. Ascaris associated liver cysts have been described, Javid reference, and are not rare, the sonographic appearance of these cysts are quite characteristic and not consistent with our toddy tippler. Now, to a statement of what this lesion most likely is. The breadcrumbs on this trail lead directly to PD6, specifically pages 160 to 163. A quality book I just discovered to be stitch-bound in signatures, a quality anachronism perhaps as rare as anchovy sauce these days. <laughs> oh. The intercostal sign is the dead giveaway. Amoebic abscesses in India and Sri Lanka is overwhelmingly found in males who consume large quantities of palm wine or toddy. Speculations as to the mechanisms of susceptibility of palm wine drinkers can be reviewed in Kumanin's article. Case series reports a male to female ratio of 13 to 1 in amoebic liver uh, abscesses. Hypotheses are to why E. histolytica forms abscesses in this group range from host factors, liver damage by alcohol, contamination of the beverage, etc. I suggest that the rainy season detail is a red herring since the case series in Sri Lanka by Kanathasen reported that amoebic liver abscesses instance peaked during the dry season. <laughs> <laughs> It is important to note, as PD6 emphasizes, that antecedent dysentery is seen in less than 50% of liver amoebic abscess patients. Our patient also has an elevated alkaline phosphatase, an indicator of biliary tract or liver damage, and is common in amoebic abscess patients. Lab findings exhaustively reviewed by Jane. 
patients, pleural effusion may represent extension of the liver abscess or perhaps an inflammatory reaction producing a sterile effusion. Pleural effusion, almost always right-sided, can be seen in 30% of patients. Mm. Diagnosis is through a combination of sonographic findings and serology. Aspiration of amoebic cyst can be diagnostic via antigen testing or nucleic acid amplification testing. Note that organisms are seldom seen in the aspirate. Treatment can be conservative, especially in lesions less than 7 centimeters, i.e. a 72-hour course of metronidazole with drainage performed if response is poor, outlined by Kale. Extraintestinal amoebiasis, specifically liver abscess, is a serious matter with some case series reduced reporting a mortality of 2.5%. Pharmacological treatment of the abscess in the simplest cases may be metronidazole for 10 days, followed by treatment with a luminal agent. Treatment must be individualized for more complex cases or mixed bacterial amoebic infection. In the interest of sparing the moderators and listeners, a pedantic exegesis on anchovy sauce. I refer you to the terminal references below. Thanks to all TWIP hosts and participants for perpetually enlightening listening. <laughs> okay. And then we have a, a lot of references. I mean, a lot of you references. Should, uh, we, these will all be in the website under <laughs> letters. And I highly recommend people read them. Because oh, this is fantastic. This is, this is an incredible resource. For example, listeners to TWIV 504, Flying Foxes and Barking Pigs will be familiar with date palm with palm wine because if you collect date palm sap from the trees, you leave the, the, the uh, canister on the tree overnight and the bats go in because they right. like it too right. and they urinate and defecate and put the virus in and then when you drink it you get Nipah virus and exactly. so the low tech solution to that was putting covers on them mm -hmm. which prevented the bats from coming out right. from uh, drinking the other part that's very interesting is um, this part some references concerning the anchovy sauce anchovy paste conundrum and he writes I discourage clinicians from analogizing findings using <laughs> culinary comparisons such as the swelling was the size of an almond, the tumor was the size of a lemon, beefy red granulation tissue, anchovy sauce pus. The comparisons become vague or uninterpretable in a cross-cultural context. How many listeners have anchovy sauce in their fridges or, for that matter, have even seen a bottle of this stuff? It's probably even more unlikely in Tamunidal. See Kapoor reference below. <laughs> Additionally, if you look at Google images of anchovy sauce versus anchovy paste, you will see big difference in color and consistency. <laughs> Most photos of amoebic pus aspirate look pinkish, but some references say it is chocolate colored. There's something absurd about the whole topic of anchovy sauce. I just can't get enough of this stuff. <laughs> That's really good. And then he goes uh, here, The Surgeons Do Not Cry by Ting Tionko in 2008. We read about current jelly stools in newborns with intestinal intussusception, and nobody in class, including our old doddering professor, had ever seen a current. Heck, we didn't even know it was a berry. It was funny <laughs> when the textbook described the contents of an amoebic liver abscess as anchovy sauce-like, and all of us in class tried to, hard to imagine what <laughs> anchovy sauce looked like. And then another quote, one of the most familiar objects on the table is the bottle of anchovy sauce. It is always the same sort of bottle with an angular body and a long, narrow neck. <laughs> the first man to put up anchovy sauce was Burgess. That's from a 1912. He says you can still purchase a bottle on Amazon, anchovy sauce, 190 ml, $9. Oof. Have to go get some. And uh, I, I, this is just great. And he goes down. Also, he's got some other quotes about strawberry gallbladder, cafe au lait spots, sausage-shaped pancreas. This is a wonderful post. He goes through all of these. <laughs> food uh, Dan analogies. Daniel, That's do true. you use food analogies in your descriptions often? Yeah, unfortunately, I have to say <laughs> that it's all through the medical literature yeah. it, it are all these things where they, they talk about all these different, you know, Food related items, right. um, and it, and it's you, know, you you wonder what you know were these early <laughs> pathologists like yeah. eating eating you know was right. this the the French were around or something and exactly. everything yeah. related to what they were going to have for lunch or dinner, um, but no it is it is very entertaining because yeah I mean how how many people have ever actually seen anchovy paste yeah that's right 
So I, I used to say in my classes when I taught about um, assisted psychosis that the, the cysts, when they calcify, and you can feel them under the skin sometimes, they're about the size of all the syrupy. <laughs> <laughs> There's one more quote worth um, mentioning. It's, it's uh, called Culinary Medicine by right. Kapoor. It's in an Indian Journal of Surgery. Culinary terms have been used to describe anatomy. While Indian cuisine is popular all over the world, <laughs> no Indian dish finds mention in medical terminology. Nope. In intra-abdominal adhesions, sometimes, the intestinal loops are so densely adherent that it's difficult to make out proximal from distal, impossible to separate them without injuring the bowel, resulting in spill of contents. Resection is the only option. Jal- halebi or jalebi, an Indian dessert, has a single long tubular strip of five fried batters filled with sugary syrup so intertwined that it is impossible to discern a tent. <laughs> if broken, the syrup spills out. The best way to relish it is to chew the whole piece. Because of these similarities between them, I propose to name <laughs> dense intra-abdominal lesions as jalebi adhesions. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yes. Ah, love it. It's a first. That is wonderful. That's great. John writes, this is our last guest. Hello, professors. I really hope I'm not too late, but I've recently been told about your podcast by a co-worker due to my admittedly sick love of parasites. Mm-hmm. I am new to this mutualism, so I apologize for my tardiness. This just came in today, John. Your just timing is impeccable. Made it under the under the wire. For this case study with the intercostal tenderness and liver coming down, it sounds similar to an echinococcus infection, being that this species tends to aim at the liver as well as the lungs. The lesion and tenderness around those areas sound like the effects of a potential granuloid cyst. The symptom of vomiting and feeling overall ill also help facilitate a possible appearance of kinococcus granulosis. I am no doctor. I have I only have a bachelor's in biology, but I do love parasites, and finding your podcast has been filling me with glee. So thanks for that. We wish you all the best. And we are so happy to fill you with glee, aren't we? we? Are. John, you'll be pleased to know that they love you too. <laughs> parasites yes <laughs> i don't think they feel emotions well like if they that. could encounter him i'm sure they would feel his love you know i have to thank all of our listeners for these wonderful episode to episode yeah. engagements yeah, absolutely which is so almost as as um thrilling and filling us with glee right <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. i think it's great those are great so attendant. daniel what do you think um, so I'm not sure if parasites have consciousness or souls, but, you know, but no, no. <laughs> I never mentioned soul here. <laughs> we could no, I just thought they would be glad to find that. a new host, that's all. And, and if they do have emotions, now. they're probably very different than ours. Oh, but, absolutely. Uh, uh, so be, before, we, uh, before we go to the answer, we have two more people that still we need do. to guess. We do. And now that we've read all the emails, I'll start with you, Dixon. Well, what do you think? Well, uh, I can give you my professional opinion as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I had to review all this literature every year, too, when I taught this course. And um, obviously, um, Econococcus is a is a good starting guess, but it doesn't really fulfill all the requirements for the patient. Um, and they're right that there's usually no tenderness associated with the lesion in the liver, even though some of them can be the size of grapefruits. Uh, oh, did I mention that? <laughs> <laughs> Grapefruit, there you go. No food, no food uh, we, differences. Well, okay, we said tennis balls, and this would be <laughs> like a bocce ball, perhaps. Uh, but but uh, a, a, a entamoeba histolytica, on the other hand, being um, an active consumer of living tissue at the margin of whatever cysts they create inside the liver, uh, would eventually start to erode the liver. And I've uh, also read of cases where the lesion extended through the diaphragm into the lung. And that's usually a fatal situation when that happens. So we need to come back to Daniel to ask him how, he, how his patient did after they made the diagnosis. But I, I would lean 99% of my effort towards uh, the diagnosis of entamoeba histolytica. Mm. And you can actually rule that in by simply doing a serological test. So um, you wouldn't find it in the fluid, though, from the cyst itself because the, the living margin of the lesion is where the organisms are. So if you look in that whatever you want to call that, <laughs> degraded um, necrotic liver tissue, you're not going to find anything except dead liver cells. So I think isolytic is my answer. Very good. So I, I remember a long time ago, Daniel had a case yeah. of a woman with a kind of caucus cyst, and he, did, he said, you do not uh, aspirate them. Absolutely do not. not. Under no, no circumstance. So that was one of my guesses here, a liver cyst. 
um, of which I remember you can get from sheep. Yes. Right? But dogs actually catch the things from dogs. Yeah. A kind of caucus is the dog tapeworm. Right. So the egg from the adult tapeworm in the dog mm-hmm. is encountered by the sheep and the high data just develops. Right. Or and then we eat the sheep. No, no, no. You or you can eat the egg and get the same stage. How would we get that? From the dog. The dog? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the dog has the adult tapeworm mm-hmm. in their intestine. And, and then dog and then dogs like to lick a lot of places, including themselves and other yeah. other dogs themselves. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. then those eggs get and we're the sheep, we're the accidental hosts where yeah. we we end up with the uh Anka spheres. Indeed. Uh, All right. But um I said no because they wouldn't have. Well, the uh, protoscolosis is, is the case, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't have uh, yeah. drained that. So then the other is uh, is uh, amoebic, which would be entamoeba histolytica. And those are the two. Yeah. And I think uh, ent- entamoeba, as Dixon said, is is my guess. I'm going to throw my vote towards that one. And, of course, okay. a number of our listeners got that. The other well. um, possibility here for the eosinopenia that we see is mm-hmm. that um, there could be an ad- an attendant mm-hmm. lesion in the large intestine also, which could be known as an amoeboma. Again, when you look in the stool, you won't find any amoebae because they're inside the tissue, and it's completely surrounded by eosinophils. They, they're all attracted to this one zone. And as a matter of fact, when you look in the stool, the only thing you see is a, um, a pure crystal of one of the eosinophil granule contents, a protein, and it's called a charcot Leiden crystal. Mm-hmm. When you see that crystal, you you can think of eosinophilia of the gut tract. You see it in strongyloides, you see it in eosolytica, and uh, you can see it in trichuris also. So when you see that crystal, you start thinking about parasites or an allergic response to something that you just ate. So, but you didn't you didn't mention that. So uh, therefore, we didn't uh, go that in that direction. Okay. So I will say that I I mean they, I love your guys' guesses I, and the emails were fantastic this time they're they're you know they're always fantastic um, and um, the differential was laid out and and it's an important differential to have in mind before you go sticking that needle in also and and the most important is to feel confident that we're not unknowingly sticking a needle into an echinococcus um, cyst. Right. Uh, and as we mentioned, you know, there there are dogs, and this is an area where there is a certain prevalence, actually, for India, a high prevalence for echinococcus cysts. Yes. But you'll notice when I was presenting a case, I avoided the term cyst. I kept mentioning lesion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and part of it were the clinical features, but there are also radiographical features um, that uh, distinguish um, a hydatid cyst from other potential um, lesions in the liver. Mm-hmm. The hy- the hydatid cyst, right? We've talked about the sheep and the dogs. We won't talk too much about that because I'm going to say this is not echinococcus. But also on the ultrasound images, an echinococcal cyst will really – it's really a cyst. And you can actually see this thick um, echogenic um, surrounding. Uh, and, and if you look at – there's actually, I think there's some, I don't know if we have good pictures in our book. I have to check on this. But when this was imaged, this did not have that really nice, thick, characteristic, um, high dadded cyst appearance. Right. And so that moved us on to the other um, big differential is between a pyogenic bacterial cyst, um, which also might actually have a, an edge to it, or an amoebic, uh, entamoeba histolytica, lesion, Mm -hmm. which is not a true cyst, because rather than the infection being inside, the amoeba are actually in the edge, Mm. um, actually invading, and as mentioned, not in the fluid, uh, versus, you know, some other possibilities, tuberculosis, fungal, um, et cetera. And so, in this case, when it was aspirated, a um, a yellowish fluid withdrew, and and I'll use this as a point to mention that um, despite previous food references that people have made in the past. (laughs) Um, The majority of um, amoebic lesions, when aspirated, will give you a straw-colored fluid. Hmm. And a lot of the darker-colored fluid ones um, we now realize were um, secondarily infected, and they came to medical attention in part because they they had a combination. They not only had an amoebic abscess, but they had a secondary bacterial infection. So when a person comes in, a lot of times they'll, as they hit the door, they'll be put on 
broad spectrum antibiotics, which in much of the world is ceftriaxone. Um, if the concern is there for an amoebic abscess, as there was in this situation, they're also started on um, metronidazole, which not only covers um, amoebic possibilities, but also is a good anaerobic exactly. medication. Exactly. Um, so it's it covers our bases. And then um, you can wait to see, does the aspirate grow anything? Uh, which might be helpful, particularly as we're getting drug resistance in the world, or antigen testing, which in this case can confirm the presence of an amoebic uh, lesion. And so, in this case, the antigen was positive for amoeba, and the cultures did not grow. So, we were left with our, our entamoeba histolytica diagnosis. And um, after a couple days, when cultures were negative, ceftriaxone was stopped. Patient was continued on a course of metronidazole, encouraged to limit the amount of uh, toddy that he consumed, and uh, went on to do well. Good. Did the lesion in the lung had uh, little or nothing to do with it communicating to the liver? Well, that's what I wanted to point out. There was there was no lesion in the lung. No okay. lesion. Effusions. You mentioned effusions. <clears throat> so it was fluid around the lung. And we see this as one of our emailers uh, mentioned. About a third of the time, people with entamoeba histolytica liver lesions will also have an associated right-sided pleural effusion. So it's just fluid around the lung. It's probably an associated inflammatory reaction. And there's no lesion actually in the lung. Interesting. Yeah. And the intercostal side is something interesting I actually learned about in India, which is this putting your finger and then pushing. And actually between the ribs, you're able to find this this localized area of tenderness that actually is right associated with where this uh, amoebic lesion is. Huh. Interesting that uh, Kevin included a few references for this. Yep. One, World Journal of Surgery, total of 510 cases of liver abscess seen between 1987 and 97. Doesn't say where, but 20 amoebic, 15 hydatid, stone-related, 59. I don't know what that means. Ascaris-related, 74. Probably uh, gallstones. There you go. Then another uh, series in Singapore, 41 liver abscess patients, hmm. 65% pyogenic, 15% amoebic. Wow. wow. 5% TB, 15% indeterminate. Hmm. And uh, the, the, the toddy is a predisposing factor. That's fascinating. Uh, you know, in the old days, back in the day, as I would say, <laughs> Dr. Brown used to say that there were some endemic centers for eostolytica, which almost always went on to extracellular, extra uh, intestinal. And one of them was Durban, South Africa. Mm -hmm. And another one was near El Paso. So they had a, they had these two strains of amoeba in two completely mm -hmm. different places where you had a very high rate of uh, extra uh, intestinal invasion, uh, whereas the rest of the world and and one of the uh, guesses uh, said that this infection can be found everywhere. So you know we wouldn't rule it out just because it's from India. Um, whether there's a high rate of of extra intestinal amoebiasis in that particular region of India, I'd love to know that because that's that's worth pointing out. Have either of you ever had toddy? No, I have not. I, I've been to India and I've never... According to uh, Kevin, in Tamil Nadu, the beverage is currently banned. It, uh, really? <laughs> That's great. For this very reason? <laughs> I don't know why. Fascinating. He says, although it varies according to the politics. <laughs> no kidding. It's weird. Weirdness. Okay. Hmm. All right. Well, anything else, Daniel? Should we, uh, Dixon, you want to do a quick run through the life cycle? People always sure. like that. Yeah, life absolutely. Cycle, life and death. Yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. This one is a direct life cycle. It involves uh, the amoebae when they live in the large intestine, which is their natural, uh, they gravitate towards the, the large intestine. Uh, these are obligate anaerobic organisms, as uh, Daniel pointed out, with regards to their susceptibility to metronidazole. And they create these flask-shaped ulcers by eroding their way through the tissue. All right? mm. And they're acquired by eating a four-nucleate cyst, inside of which there are four nuclei within the same cytoplasm of the cyst. But as the cyst goes through its environmental cues, that is, it goes from an acidic to a basic environment as it passes through the stomach into the small intestine, those nuclei uh, are activated. 
Uh, there's a guy by the name of Dobell who actually studied this very extensively back in the 20s and, and, and came up with uh, the life cycle as it ex- exits from the cyst, the existation stage. And by the time it gets to the large intestine, those four nuclei are now part of cytoplasmic organisms inside. So when it hatches, you get four organisms all, all at once out of the same cyst. And that's an interesting uh, way of starting an infection, right? You say, oh, you only need one cyst. Well, that actually is four different organisms, mm-hmm. right? <clears throat> so uh, once they exist, they find themselves up against the epithelium of the large intestine, and they immediately release enzymes at the surface, which creates a hole in the <laughs> columnar cells. It's a pore-forming protein, which actually allows the parasite to penetrate into the cytoplasm of the columnar cell and sort of inside out digest it. These organisms are greedy. If you look at them in cell cultures, for instance, you can see that before they've even finished digesting one Ch- a Chinese hamster uh, ovary cell, they're on to the next one. They just consume, 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 consume. So they don't know when to stop, right? They suffer from a sort of a parasitic so many, obesity. So many anthropomorphic <laughs> references here, Dixon. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> well, there's no uh, feedback mechanism that tells them don't stop eating. So you, ate, you eat this four <laughs> nucleus. Where do you get this four it's, nucleus it could, from? It could come from several places. One is it contaminated water okay. from fecal contaminated water. It's always feces that contaminates. So it goes um, from human to human to it human does. to it's human. It's exactly right. Are no there, animals involved? Well... You know, you can infect higher apes like um, gorillas and chimpanzees with this, but we don't think that there's much transmission. The, the, the organism then, once it gains entrance below the columnar epithelium, mm-hmm. it can then start to erode, erode away the basement membrane that, that holds the intestinal yeah. wall together, and it creates these large flask-shaped ulcers. It has a little opening to the uh, uh, the aluminum of the large intestine mm-hmm. and a very large erosional zone. Again, found at the living margin of this lesion, right? So that, that doesn't explain, though, how this organism actually gets out of that host into the next one. And what happens is, as the division cycles go on and on and on, the organisms start to accumulate, and some of them actually go back out into the lumen. And when that happens, we think that's the stimulus for these things to round up and insist. Now, at that point, they're a single nucleus mm-hmm. organism. Mm-hmm. So they somehow have to divide their nuclei twice to create a four-nucleate cyst. They sequester all the ribosomes. Vincent, you'd be uh, interested in knowing what that looks like, actually. A collection of ribosomes that's packed so densely that it crystallizes inside of the cyst. Wow. Why do they do that? And it's called a chromatoidal bar. What's the function of that? <clears throat> because they're not synthesizing anything at this point. They're yeah. rounding up and sequestering themselves, and they're getting ready for the next host. And so out it goes in the fecal... Um, event and of course with a heavy infection of eastolytica it causes uh, dysentery which is bloody diarrhea Mm -hmm. so you get a watery bloody diarrhea as a result of long-term exposure to the infection and then eventually these these cysts which are resistant to all kinds of things like low ph high ph um, temperatures upwards of 90 degrees uh, uh, fahrenheit even higher than that of course um and lots of aquatic environments that they can survive in for many days, up to weeks. And the next person encounters them either through a food mm-hmm. handler that isn't very sanitary mm-hmm. about their own personal habits or because of the generalist. Now, you said diarrhea. This man did not have diarrhea. He did not, though, because he didn't have any demonstrative uh, intestinal form left. Okay. A lot of times, about half of the cases mm-hmm. where you have an extra intestinal cyst, the intestinal form disappears. And it doesn't come back. They heal, and that's the end of it. And then you've got this other smoldering tissue stage to worry about. Now, that's not the only place it could go, even though the circulation from the large intestine Mm -hmm. would lead it back to the liver. You could also have brain lesions. You can have lesions in the lungs. You can have lesions in other organs as well. Man. So E.S. Lytic is an is a equal opportunity tissue ingester. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> as a result, some there are so many, uh, the literature is filled with these aberrant cases where these uh, other sites were infected as well. Okay. Much to the chagrin of the host, in case, cases that are acute, they can actually die from this. So uh, that's basically the life cycle. Fascinating. You can, you can, or you can uh, become a chronically infected person in addition to an acutely infected person because it's all the signs and symptoms mm-hmm. of the intestinal stage and the extra intestinal stage. Of course, when it gets to the extra intestinal, 
there are no cysts that are formed because how would they get out of the host? So this gentleman is not going to give it to his family, right? No, not at all. Good. No. But there are people that are chronically infected, so therefore they're asymptomatic. Yeah. Yeah. They're called cyst passers. <laughs> that's interesting. Cyst they passers. Are. Cyst passers, because that's what they're doing. They're passing cysts out into the environment, wow. which can then infect other people. Cyst and the next thing you know. another good title. The <laughs> I got three right. titles so far. Body tappers. I like it. Breadcrumbs on the trail. Yep. Cyst passers. There you go. They're all good, aren't they? They're Agatha Christie novel titles. <laughs> Are they? <laughs> Why not? You like Agatha? I do. I do. I think she... Uh, and then there were none. <laughs> it's I a religious I never read truth. any Agatha Christie. Well, you know, but you've seen them in the movies. No, right? I've never seen any. You never saw the Murder on the Orient Express? No, my wife likes it. But she says that she, what Agatha does is give you many many possibilities for who did it. Correct. Is that correct? That is exactly oh, okay. right. She makes you think everyone that shows up is... Sometimes they did it. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. Okay, thank you very much. And we will now give away a book. We will do that. We had six guesses. Let's pick a random number between one and six. I have a feeling we're going to get someone who already got it. Well... Let's just do. Then you know what? Pass it on. <laughs> number four. Number four came up. Who number, was number four? Let's so, just see about Let's that. see. Can someone tell me who's number four? First was uh, Caitlin. Right. And, and second, friend. And friend. Second was Adam. Third was David. And fourth was Adil, who... Um, Adil. I think we already won one, right? No, re remember he got two chances but didn't win. Oh, Wasn't that well, this time you won, Adil. That's overjoyed. <laughs> Winner. Okay, we overjoyed. need to... Uh, if I don't have your address, Adil... Isn't Adil the person who also loves parasites? No, that was someone oh, at the end. Okay, I'm sorry. No, but Adil, he's male. He twi did tell us. Twip, uh, twi I mean, no, the deal is a guy. <laughs> Twip at microbe.tv uh, address. If it's overseas, uh, uh, include the phone, please. And uh, those of you listening, I, I, I do owe a few of you books. I haven't mailed them all yet. I'm sorry I'm tardy. I, I will Are get you them a, out. A, 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 um, a, a, oh, darn, what is the name of that drink again? Toddy. Toddy. Toddy Tapper. No, a Taddy Tapper is someone who collects the date palm sap from the palm tree. I know that, but and you know, you a Tardy Tardy <laughs> If you go to uh, the Smithsonian, the Outbreak exhibit, they actually have a exhibit with a couple of palm trees and really? taps for and the covers for the NEPA. Yeah, and they also have a big bat. Wow. See something out the window, Dixon? I do. What is it? So. It's a, oh my gosh, it's a B-25. It's an old World War II bomber. That. Yeah. It is with the two fins. That's right. That's yeah. right. How I, about that? Yeah. Now, now, is that for some show? I imagine so. I hope yeah. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, we don't use those anymore, right? No, we're not using those any longer. All right. I'm sorry. I was distracted. It's okay. We're okay. Well, now let's do a paper. Really hey. interesting. Very interesting paper. I, I totally fascinating with it, and I totally agree with uh, Daniel's choice of this paper. This was a great paper because of many things that will come out of it, as I'm sure right. we will right. find Published out. Published in PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases. Title, Population Genetic Analysis of Ch Chadian Guinea Worms, reveals that human and non-human hosts share common parasite populations. Right. And the authors, the first author is Elizabeth Thiel from Vassar College, in Poughkeepsie, where I was just on Sunday visiting my son, he said to me, uh, <laughs> "It's very funny. We're driving to get something to eat, and he said Vassar is a serious school, but it's a hallucinogenic school." <laughs> really? Yeah. I said, "You want to go?" He said, "No, no. There's just too much hallucinogenic." <laughs> um, and then uh, the last author is Ernesto Ruiz Tiben from uh, the Carter Center in Atlanta. Nice. And other centers here, we have a CDC contribution and uh, the Welcome Sanger Institute in the UK. Well, the Carter Center has certainly been concerned about this particular infection. So, so Daniel, tell us the backstory. Yes. I think, sir, you know, Dixon always says, so I'll throw in. Ernesto is actually, uh, I sat with him and his wife when uh, President Carter, uh, former President Carter, I guess he'll carry the title, was in New York. Um, and I had met Carter, and then uh, Ernesto mm -hmm. Rose Tibbon, his wife, and I uh, listened to the panel that was done at the Museum of Natural History when they did the neglected uh, diseases 
that the Carter Center is focused on eradicating. Mm. But the nice thing in this um, is that we actually, the authors give us an executive summary, which I'm, I'm going to try to make a little bit briefer. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but what they talk about is that originally um, there were millions of people that suffered from guinea worm infection. Right. And uh, in the mid-1980s, uh, guinea worm was formally targeted for eradication and there's been a tremendous number of a uh, tremendous amount of success and uh, we now have less than 100 cases in in the world and of the original 21 countries uh, 16 of them have been certified free of disease by the world health organization and so we went from 3.5 million down to about 30 cases in 2017 that's remarkable so this is this is you know as much as you hear bad news this is good news, yep. and there are there are really three countries <clears throat> where we're still seeing endemic transmission and that's Ethiopia, Mali, the South Sudan. But we're going to be talking about Chad, and Chad seems to have this issue that um, they've been suggesting might be tied to the fact that and this reminds me of an earlier discussion that maybe an assumption that. Um, Dr Dracunculus metanensis, the assumption that this was only um, a human disease may be untrue. It may be that the exact same parasite can infect um, animals other than humans, and that maybe it, particularly in Chad, infects dogs. And this is going to be a population genetic analysis that is going to, as we see, strongly suggest um, that the same um, guinea worms that infect human populations um, infect dogs. Dixon um, or, or Daniel. So Chad had been free for 10 years, correct? And then came back and then they found it in dogs. Is that the story here? They they started seeing it in dogs, but then they actually had a few um, human cases. Right. And cats. And Don't forget cats. Cats. And cats and and there's there's another right. uh, animal, so, but anyway, uh, baboon. but it was interesting because the so the olive baboons in Ethiopia, but the domestic cats in Chad as well as dogs. But they noticed it was sort of odd. It was these spotty um, numbers of cases. It, it didn't seem like it was following the pattern you would expect where a person had gone to. We like to talk about the step well and then infected some other people. It was right. this person here, this person over there. And that was when there was a science nature paper, actually, in 2016, that suggested this connection potentially with dogs as another host. Dixon, can you give us a, a two-minute summary of uh, Dracunculus and how we sure. get it and how what it does to us yeah, right, and right. how they eradicated it? Happy to do it. Yep, your so, time's up. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> so it's a waterborne infection. It's acquired by ingesting an infected intermediate host called a copepod. And uh, it's there are varieties of these. There, there's one called Dioptimus, which is very common in uh, most of the Middle East and in India. There's another one um, which you can find in fish tanks in Daphnia. Remember Daphnia, mm -hmm. how common mm -hmm. that was? And so it's related to those uh, kinds of things. And the way it happens is that you ingest water uh, that you've just obtained from a freshwater source. Let's make it a step well because that was the classic that was depicted. Uh, in that water, you've got, of course, water, but you've also got copepods. And because you were sitting or at least putting your legs in the step well to cool yourself because it was hot, the worm, which lives in the subcutaneous tissues, had actually created a blister at its head end, which began to fill with larvae for some time. Now, this was ongoing. And as the pressure builds, as the blister gets larger, there's pain associated with this. The relief for which is to stick your leg into water. The blister bursts, the pain goes away. So there's an association between relieving pain and the spread of this infection. So imagine yourself sitting in a step well, your leg is in the water, the blister bursts, out come the larvae, and at the same time, with the bucket that you're carrying, you scoop up the water in front of you to bring back to your village or where you live, and you put on your shoulder after you cooled yourself, and you start walking back to the where you live. And now the larvae inside the water are very small, and the copepods consider those food, and they start to scavenge them inside the bucket you've got a little micro ecosystem mm -hmm. and the the copepods are munching down on larvae little known to them the larvae once inside the copepod begins to munch down on the copepod 
And so it, they eventually insist in the copepod, mm. and they form the infectious stage, which is the third stage larva for most nematodes. And this is a nematode infection related to filarial parasites. And so it takes about a week for that to happen. And now the water is infectious. For whoever drinks that water, they're going to get at least one dracunculus worm. Of course, you have to drink two copepod, you know, two infected copepods to have a complete infection. If one is a male and one is a female, and then it gets bizarre because once you swallow these parasites, they penetrate the small intestine, then they get inside the blood, then they get out of the blood into the perineal cavity, and they start to migrate against the the pull of gravity. That's remarkable. This worm has a sense of which way up and down is. If a host is standing straight up, it knows that it should migrate down towards the polar gravity, the the heavier end of the gravity scale rather than migrating up. And it eventually ends up localizing after mating within the subcutaneous tissue of the long limbs. That's for most typical cases. Where does it mate? Where is the male? We don't know much about the life cycle of this parasite. Once it's inside of a mammalian host, then uh, the female starts to grow and grow and grow. And she can be as long as a meter in terms of, you know, Mm -hmm. three feet long, something like that. And there she sits, you know, with her head down near your ankle. uh, And for many, many months, nothing happens. Nothing. There's no pain. There's no sense that the worm is there. It's as thin as a a large, uh, thick thread that you'd use to sew a button on your coat with. That's how big this worm is. And so, and then at one point, the blister starts to form. So, if that bursts and the, they come out, does the mother stay inside? And she does. It can heal up and do it again or again. Well, usually the, the worm ends up dying oh, okay. at that point. And the then point you, is, then you look down and you see the worm. You pull you, it out they all know what this is. You know, this is an ancient infection, yeah, yeah. and the the um, the symbol for medicine shows. Um, yeah. Caduceus. Uh, the caduceus. As, it, it started out as a stick with two snakes wrapped around yeah. it. And that was the original depiction of this, which had nothing to do with the current iteration. So we, we, we speculate that this was a way of showing how this infection is cured. Mm-hmm. Because traditionally, yeah. the head of the worm is <laughs> grabbed, right? The worm is still alive here now. And you take something like a matchstick. And you wrap the head of the worm. Not a matchbox, a matchstick. No, not a matchbox, a (laughs) matchstick. And you start to turn very slowly and actually pulls the worm out of its niche. Now, if you break it, Mm, then then you get the the term that the Israelites applied to this when you do it's called the fiery serpent of the Israelites because it was well known throughout the Middle East that this was not the thing to do. Mm-hmm. It takes you about a week and a half to two weeks to extract this worm. Do you remember Daniel's case of the guy who came some, from somewhere and got, it developed this here and they had to find someone to twist Exactly it. right. Exactly. It was from West Africa, as I recall. Yeah. So, How did they eradicate this or almost eradicate by filtering well, the water? I'll leave that to Daniel. How did they do that? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll jump in with a couple things. So one, I always thought the terminology was interesting when they say they're grabbing the head because you're you're really grabbing the the uterus, right? I mean, this well, is well, it's the, the head of the worm, though. Yeah, the uterus. Grab- of the, the uterus of the worm comes out almost where the oral cavity of the worm is. It's that close. The mm. the vulvar opening where the larvae come out is exactly opposite the the mouth part. Yeah, so you're you're grabbing that as Dixon yes. described, and then you're you're wrapping it with a with a little stick, and this is still what they're doing today to to treat these people. Yeah. And you're pulling about a centimeter, centimeter and a half per day. So it can take up to thirty. You know, we say you know it's a meter long, a hundred centimeters. You can you can do the math. This can take you know more Several than weeks. Yeah, it could take weeks. It's and this person so, is out of business. I mean, whatever they did for a living, they can't do anything until they get rid of this thing. Uh, so they're stuck. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they, they got a little stick thing sticking there. You yeah, but what if that <laughs> breaks, though? What if it breaks? Tape it to your yeah, it, yeah, no, and, and as Dixon mentioned, this is a problem. If it does break, oh, if you kill it. the worm before you extract it, then they can actually end up with infection because while the worm is still alive and being extracted, um, it seems to be producing an anti-inflammatory um, mm. or at least anti-inflammatory products, which, right. which allow you to basically tolerate this. But should you... Mm 
kill it, should you just tear not knowing what you're doing, then the area can become inflamed, infected, and actually people can, that that's when you can have death and disfigurement. Right. Um, but, but you gotta break the cycle, and, and Vincent, you started to suggest it, it's really that simple is you don't want to drink water with copepods, water fleas. They're big enough that just pouring the water, filtering the water through um, a fabric, uh, a sarong, a scarf, or these little drinking straws that were distributed by the Carter Center through throughout Africa um, allows you to basically get the water but not ingest the copepods. Right. And so they've, they've gone with incredible tracking and everything was great until, boom, all of a sudden these cases started popping up yeah. in areas where they thought it was gone. And now, now we're seeing, I think this paper does a good job, I, I find it compelling, um, showing that the same Trachonculus metanensis that affects humans is also infecting dogs. So here's an interesting question and because – Obviously, I agree with the genetic results of the, the finding. It was done by a very uh, competent group of people. How does the dog catch it? Mm, well, they lick, the they lick things, as Daniel said. Yeah, no, no, no. That's they, for kind they of drink, And they drink water. <laughs> that's for a kind of caucus. Yeah, okay, but, they know, go to the step wells, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we know how people catch it because they bring the water back to their home. Right, and so maybe these are domestic dogs that we're worried well, about but here. They could go to the step wells and so, drink. So... Well, then there are no step wells in this area of Africa. I don't think. Right, so I think how do these are all. Get it? Well, what kind of well do they? That's do? a great question because I think they're not getting it from wells. I think they're getting it from the rivers. I think I saw this map, yeah. and, and it looks like they're getting it from a natural source. Then then the you have dog, to yeah, add the to Shari that. River. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so the dogs could go there, but it's a slow-moving river. Yeah. You're right. It's in Central Africa, and it's. Uh, you know, it may allow for the cycle to go on in like a little eddy, a little back eddy, and, and that would serve as a step well too, sure. But, you know, you have to drink a lot of water in order to get these copepods perhaps. And mm -hmm. so the dogs drink far less water than humans. They do. And so I, I, I just had to think about, you know, what are the odds that the dogs would become infected? But I think they drink water more during the day than people. Even though they drink less each time, they probably drink on the average more altogether because they're perhaps, mm. I don't know. It's just a speculation on my part. Daniel, how did they come to this conclusion that they're the same? Yeah, right. D. Metanensis. Oh, yeah, actually, it, it is interesting. So they, they did, I'm going to go back, um, they did our uh, ribosomal sequencing. Mm. And I'm going to get back to where they talk a little bit about that. So um, they're going to do. Um, you know, I think what we're familiar with the 18s um, RNA um, sequencing, and they're they're analyzing this for nuclear microsatellites, which are these repeats. And people maybe remember these from like the original DNA, where they used to do um, enzyme digestions, and you looked at the lengths of what would run out. And now this has gotten a little more sophisticated. Uh, but they did that, and they found um, when they did analysis that um, this genetic typing basically showed that there was not much variation yep. between the Dracunculus meninensis infecting dogs and that affecting um, humans. So they, they did some right. different genetic analysis, um, they principal at component some, uh, analysis. They did some mitochondrial genes also. For, that's right. for mitochond in addition to those microsatellites, uh, they looked at mitochondrial right. genes. Right, but they had some problems here because they were sampling the larvae mostly from the uterus. So it's a good point. How do they get their samples? Then they had males and females to worry about. So right? they can get the worm out of dogs? How do they get this? Do we yeah, I, I actually thought this was interesting. They um, So th they talked about the fact that they were able to obtain emerging adult female worms Emerge. from both human and non-human. So, so mm -hmm. they did talk about the issue that you, know, you could worry about um, larval contamination. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually thought about the genetics of that. Would the larva be genetically different than the adult female? No, no, of course not. Uh, yeah, so I really, didn't really see that as being a problem. But they were but, worried about males versus females, I think. The, the, the mitochondria, the, the mitochondrial uh, aspect. Hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess that's true. Um, Why? What's the worry? We both have mitochondria. And the females pass them, but we yes, both have the females them. pass them. Yes, exactly right. But they're the they're you well, get them from females, so I don't see where that would. I think anything. they would prefer to have had just worm material from a single source rather than all these larvae plus the worm. Yeah, see, I, I wasn't really bothered because if you they think were. about if the male and females are are basically 
um, producing offspring. They're, they're going to be genetically similar enough that they can do that. No, I hear you. And so, yeah, so I'm not really thinking like, are they worried about a hybrid, um, you know, female worms of one species that may or may not have um, copulated or um, been fertilized by males of some other. So I, I, I wasn't as worried. I mean, they, they bring this up in discussion and Probably the reviewers tortured them, but I was <laughs> not. Perhaps. You know, I, I found that, you know, as mentioned, the four mitochondrial genes that they looked at and the ribosomal analysis, I, I found it right. very compelling. Um, uh, in a dog, would you find the worm in the same place in the leg? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Now, of course, uh, in a dog, it's a more of a problem because they uh, can't have it extracted by a nice no, they you know, can't. match or whatever. No, so they, they probably can't. break and inf- inflame a lot, right? Or it it dies and calcifies. Yeah, I think mm. we've also we've talked about this in otters, for instance, and oh, sometimes yeah, right. yeah, yeah. sometimes dracunculus will act a little bit different in different species. Humans, it tends to have these long tracks that where you can often get more of a nest clustering in different animals. Yeah, I remember the otter paper we did not too long ago. That's right. Yeah, and you you worry about you know dogs like to chew um, on an area that bothers them. So if they had the same sort of issue, uh, you know, and, and we got to realize Dracunculus has been around for you know thousands, thousands, you know, million probably years in different um, animals. So you know the dogs are not going extinct in these areas. They're not getting these horrible infections. So it probably is a slightly different um, pathology in the in the dogs. Mm, good point. Okay, so dogs and humans have. Pretty much the same Dracunculus metanensis. So, what does this mean for eradication? <laughs> That's the big conundrum, isn't it? Because if it was only a human disease, like smallpox, for instance, uh, you just have to get rid of it. Yeah, of people, course. there's no reservoir host, but this one now apparently has a reservoir. So, they say that the conclusion that 10 years of zero cases in Chad was probably due to insufficient surveillance that I was would, always there. I would agree with that. Mm. Actually, I wouldn't. It's always a problem, isn't it? It is, because in order to survey for this parasite, you look for the scarred lesions on the feet of people. Mm -hmm. So that's evidence that it's still there, right? So when they see that there's no scars, therefore they must say that there's no... Yeah. But remember, this is not a a peaceful area of the world, right? This has Mm -hmm. lots of... Conflict, civil yeah. unrest yeah. and uh, some pi- populations migrating. and So they say <clears throat> that, you know, there are many, many more dogs than humans in Chad. Many. And they're probably maintaining the worms. Even if it's not much in humans, they're in dogs. So you can't ever eradicate it, I guess, right? Maybe not there. Well, you know, I'm in a sense glad we didn't know, didn't know this back when this was um, – I guess slated for eradication Mm -hmm. because that was one of the criteria. They said, okay, let's take a disease that only infects humans. So we know if we target, there's no, um, they've still made, you know, a tremendous amount of success going from over 3 million to about 30. Um, so it sort of shows it it may be okay. And, uh, will we, yeah, will we completely, uh, that's one of the requirements for eradication that there's no non-human hosts. Yeah, they may not have done it. So So maybe in this area there is, but what about in other areas? That's a good question. You know, they say that uh, infections in dogs and cats have been known before. Yes. Right. So they thought it was another species. Yeah. The insignus. That's a But they're saying this is not novel. Then dogs are actually quite susceptible to demedinensis. So it's been going on for a while. It's possible also that there's some cultural behavior here between people Uh, and their pets that allows them more exposure to the waters that they bring back from wherever they came from. Mm -hmm. You know, which which are the sources of water. These are not wells that they're coming from. This is the river itself, I think. So do we know in the other countries whether there are infections in dogs and cats? We don't, do we? I don't. But I think they're going to start looking probably. Yep. Because they don't want to say it's eradicated and then in a couple of years have some reemergence because it's in dogs, right? Exactly. Mm. Exactly. They also say that um, some amphibious and aquatic vertebrates could be facilitating Worm transmission as paratenic or transport host. What does that mean? It means that the parasite that's ingested by, let's say, a reptile that eats a copepod, uh-huh. it contains the same stage as the copepod. It didn't advance to the next I stage. See. And then a dog so, could eat a reptile. Exactly, exactly, and exactly. Get it. You got it. You Looks got like it. we need to do some work here. Well, you know what? There's always work. There's field work needed. There is. If you went to Chad, yes. what would you be at risk of acquiring? Malaria. Mm. Schistosomiasis. 
<sighs> Leishmaniasis. Oh, boy. High-speed lead poisoning. What's that? <laughs> Being shot. High-speed lead poisoning. <laughs> okay. And you know what? In Africa, and I know that I'm being pejorative here a little bit, but I'm not trying to be, but yeah. the rate of automobile deaths mm-hmm. from careless driving is very high there because they don't maintain roads as well, and yeah. they don't maintain yeah. cars as well, of course. Who are we to talk about that? But um, So those are, those are real issues when you uh, – live in areas that don't have the luxury i think of of all the infrastructure that we enjoy daniel would you agree that even in these other countries where we don't see um guinea worm any longer we should go in and see if it's in dogs and cats i think it's i think it's important and i i think also in the the countries that the who has certified as um free of this disease, it, it does raise the issue. Is that really true? Or is it just so infrequent that it's below the level of detection and it's mm. still sitting there in, in dogs and, you know, other cats and um, other animals? But I guess the other thing I'm also going to jump on poor Dixon here mm-hmm. is that, you know, it, there's this stereotype of Africa as it's all a country of unrest. And um, but Chad is Chad's doing decently well. I mean, it's at risk of some overflow from surrounding areas. But, you know, if you go to Chad, I think the things you have to worry about is swim in the fresh water. You might get schistosomiasis. You should worry about malaria. And it's in the meningitis belt, um, tuberculosis, HIV, things like that. Um, and probably the most important thing, as Dix did mention, is uh, motor vehicle accidents. Mm. So. Have you been Dix, uh, Dixon or Daniel to Chad? No, I have not. I have not. No. All right. Dad, Daniel's done much more traveling in Africa than I have. Cool. Very interesting. All right, next up is a hero. We do have our hero for today. And in fact, we've had some nice feedback from some of our listeners telling us that they enjoy this part of the show. So They want us to do it on TWIV now. They do. And I think we're going to do it, too. I think we, we should. Did, we did one on Friday. It was we did one on Adolf Friday. Meyer. The there you go. First virus ever discovered. That's right. Tobacco mosaic, right? Who discovered the first parasite ever? Um, well, you know, you can trace that back to the 16 and 1700s because we've known about tapeworms a long time. And um, some of the old, old literature on these diseases goes back into the, you know, the mm-hmm. 9, 1200s and the 1300s. Because uh, right. we've known, we didn't know what they were, but we did know that uh, having one meant that you were different from a lot of other people. So, yeah. speaking of which, I was going to go with guinea worm going all the way back to the yes, Egyptians. That's right. right. This that's, is... No, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So it's a miracle that it took so long for the germ theory of disease to catch on, considering the fact that we've known about some of these things for a very long time. By the way, Dixon, who yes. developed the germ theory of disease? Well, it was developed by uh, some Germans, actually. <laughs> some Germans. <laughs> Coke. 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 And and, and colleagues Koch. and and you're looking at one of the contemporaries, I believe, um, of Koch, uh, a man by Sorry. the name of Carl. God bless you. <laughs> that you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Trying to get the book uh, all wet. Um, this gentleman's name, and he's an august parasitologist of some repute, uh, is named Carl George Friedrich Rudolf Leuchart. Rudolf. <clears throat> yes. What's his last name? No, his last name is Leuchart. L. L-E-U-C-K-A-R-T, Leuchart. And he, he has a PhD, and his years were from 1822 to 1898. So I'll just read what it says here. It says, Leuchart is best known for his research on life cycles of Fasciola hepatica, Trichinella spiralis, and the tapeworms that infect humans, Tania saginata and Tania solium. He was instrumental in establishing meat inspection for Trichinella spiralis and Tania solium in slaughtered pigs and Tania saginata in slaughtered cattle. But this doesn't really speak to his uh, his contributions because he published lots of papers and he studied with some of the best German parasitologists of his day. And he, he obviously was one of those people. So if you ask where the, the real science of parasitology began, it began in Germany. So um, hmm. there was a lot of people that that, that worked on this, uh, and uh, he was one of the heroes. This is your hero, Trichinella Spiralis. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, no question about it. No question about it. He was born in 1822 and died in 1898, 75 years old. 
So Rudolf Virchow was a colleague, and uh, he worked with him for some time, and uh, they both worked together on Trichinella. You didn't pick him as a hero yet, right? Uh, no, Virchow? Yeah, remember, this is it's alphabetical. alphabetical. Okay. <laughs> so Virchow is, it starts with a V. Because he's on the cover of your website. He is. Right. He is. Virchow. And every so, time we work on it, I hear you saying Virchow. There's, there's, a, there's a joke like that, and it, it goes something like, uh, <laughs> tell me, Mr. Wagner, do you... St- do you spell your name with a V? And he says, 9W. <laughs> <laughs> 9W. <laughs> Which is a root over here, yeah, by the way. So. He goes through Poughkeepsie. That's right. On the on the west, oh, the other side of the river. There's 9W right. and 9E. That's true. You know? That's it's true. very cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that, thank that's you. his richtig. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> that's correct. You know a little German? A little. I, I'm a <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, do you have a new case study for us? I, I do, but I was going to say, you know, before our emailers write in and uh, sort of comment about Coke, that I always think of Coke as having postulates to prove that things were caused by germs. Oh, diseases, I but guess. The actu- but the actual idea that there were these tiny little contagious sort of agents, um, yes. some of us uh, attribute this to an Italian Vincent, mm. a, oh, yes. a Francastoro in the early 1500s. And yet, if you you know remember the word fomites, we always talk about fomites as uh, the Latin for tinder. Mm. And he had this idea that this this tinder, these fomites, these tiny um, infectious things, would actually, in his uh, De Contagion book, would actually be the source. And for hundreds of years, people sort of used him as a theory until later he. Uh, I don't know, sort of other people came up with other ways to actually prove that the, this idea was was true. So anyway, but let me jump into a new case. Who's ready for a new case? Mm, bring, bring it on. Bring, bring it on. <laughs> go for it. Let's go. Okay. Come on, we're ready. Uh, so, so this is a patient who was referred to me as for a consultation. Wait, can I interrupt you just for one moment? Because I've just noticed something here, that which is astounding. And that is the hero that I just read, uh, Rudolf Leuchardt is on the page opposite the beginning of our description of Dracunculus metanensis. How about that? <laughs> Which is just talked about. Just yep. by chance, we've got two hits in one go. So I'm sorry to interrupt the uh, description. That's, that's, that's okay. My deepest apologies. Uh, certainly. So our, our case is a 40-year-old immigrant from Brazil. Uh, he reports, um, well, the, the story is that this individual was a farmer, uh, who had worked in Brazil, actually his family in the U.S., and that's what brings him uh, to the United States in his later years. And uh, while here in the U.S., about a year before seeing me, he goes to see another physician because he's having an uh, increased heart rate. Um, he has some weakness, doesn't have any, um, reports to me, congestive heart failure symptoms. Maybe we'll talk more about that in the next time. But he does have some arrhythmia problems. Uh, he is having some premature ventricular contractions, actually having some uh, episodes of atrial fibrillation and flutter. Uh, he's treated uh, by an outside cardiologist with amiodarone, actually ends up having an implantable um, defibrillator. And um, at this point, he's referred to me because they say, yeah, he's from Brazil. We wonder if there's any any issue. Uh, so we, we get a little further history, and then we do some diagnostic testing. And one of the things, I'm going to give you a couple of little bits of information here. He has an EKG done, which shows that he has a right bundle branch block on his EKG. And he has an echocardiogram done. And this echocardiogram shows that his heart is dilated. The left ventricle is dilated with an apical aneurysm. Um, there is some mild hypokinesis, and actually there's thrombosis in this um, aneurysm. So mm. I actually think that's enough. It is That's enough. more than I think, enough. <laughs> I think people are going to know. People so know. I think people will probably know what he has. Yes. So a couple things I'm going to ask people is, um, so how – you know, what, what might he have? Let's get a differential. How might you confirm the, the most likely diagnosis? Right. Um, how would you treat this individual? Ah, uh, yes. Now, uh, as part of the giveaway next time, in addition to, to PD6, I also have three copies of Red Mother by Laurel 
Radziski. All right. Who has written in before, and she wrote this book. It was a book of poetry about a parasite living in your intestinal tract. <laughs> so if you would like a copy of that, uh, we will give that away next time. Let's see. How should we do this? Ah. If you want Red Mother, let us know when you send in your guess. Yes. It's a nice little book that you'll enjoy. Indeed. Thanks to Laurel for sending us a couple to give away. It's very generous. Yes, totally. It's poetical, even. Uh, do you want to do a couple of uh, emails? Why not? Just a few? Sure. Uh, first is from Anthony on TWIP 113. There's a discussion of chickens and toxoplasmosis. Some speculation on how chickens contracted the disease followed. Yep. The suggestion that birds might consume contaminated material and or mechanical vectors certainly seems reasonable. In addition, chickens eat mice and so can be infected directly. Do? He said there's a book on Amazon where the author claims that mites are vectors. That would be interesting. Is that possible? Everything is possible. For chickens. I <laughs> never heard that one, but how would this work? Mites transmitting, I don't know, from one chicken to another, right? The parasite would have to survive in the mites. The mites, yes, and from, or could go from mice to chickens or cats to chickens, right? And cats and mice and chickens can cohabit in barns, so it's possible. And he continues on a separate but a related note. I don't remember a discussion of Tigandai and milk. And he sends a link to a paper, Detection and Survival of Tigandai and Milk and Cheese from Experimentally Infected Goats. Perhaps milk from infected cows are a source of human infection in India. What do we think about that? Again, everything is possible, but... Hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I'll, I'll chime in and say that there is concern, at least, you know, the USDA thinks that um, you, need to, you need to be careful about chickens and toxoplasmosis. I don't know the exact mechanism, I have to say. I don't know about, you know, the mites being part of this cycle. Um, See, what I imagine is that if, if a cat <clears throat> sheds oocysts in the stool in the field... And then the the stool is um, dispersed by, let's say, a rainstorm or something. And the oocysts are then ingested by earthworms. Mm -hmm. They could be peritonic hosts. And then the chickens eat the earthworms, and that's how they get the infection. That's what I would imagine. Okay. You know, that, that seems like a common route. But yeah. mites, that's interesting. I've never even thought okay. about it. Think about that. I might think about that. It's a vector-borne infection. That would be the first time, though, because it's not known as a vector-borne infection. So Justin sends in a link to a ProMed mail post on Powassan virus encephalitis in New York State. <laughs> However, either I misfiled this email because it's a virus, he says. It could be interesting to cover the list of known tick-borne pathogens, but this no is worries. a virus. No worries. Anthony sends us a link to a, a band called Deer Tick. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, and then a an, a link to an article on. It was very slow to load here. Uh, tick paralysis. Tick paralysis. Right. But what's causing the paralysis? Well, that's the mystery of mysteries. It's thought to be a toxin that's given off by paralysis by individual ticks, not by a group of ticks of a species, but rather yeah. single ticks of various species are capable of inducing tick paralysis. And it's not a virus or a parasite. It's, it's actually, it's it might um, be a toxin. No, yeah. There's, there's a neurotoxin in the tick saliva. And if you so much as remove the tick, the paralysis resolves. Exactly. Right. And in <laughs> so fact, it's, okay. it's pretty amazing. So it's a, you know, it's not an actual infection. I guess it's a side effect of an ectoparasitic. Mm. Um, exactly. All right. Well, it's an ectoparasite. It, it didn't yeah. go unnoticed by house either. In one of the episodes, they oh, actually yeah. had an episode of a, a woman All suffering. Right. So from this is from Massachusetts, this article. Right. Um, watch, especially at, along your hairline, inside your ears and between your toes. <laughs> okay, so right. that's good. That was, uh, and then there's another one, which is an article from NewJersey.com. It's a video of a worm crawling in a fish dinner up, obtained at Asbury <laughs> Park, New Jersey. They find a worm in codfish. Those are anisacids. They're anisacids, right? And so we've talked about that. Before. We have. And Those Anthony are says, down at the shore, everything isn't all right, which <laughs> must be from Bruce Springsteen, right? 
Probably. Daniel, uh, not Daniel, Dixon. There's another one by Anthony. Um, I'll take with it about the Civil War. Why don't sure. you take that? Okay. Anthony writes, in the Parasites Without Borders YouTube, Professor de Pommier talks about how hookworms limited the economic recovery of the South after the Civil War. It would seem, though, that by the same reasoning, the Southern slave economy never would have developed in the first place. And we'll talk about that. Quotes, children typically received no shoes at all. Thomas Jefferson, for example, did not begin issuing shoes to enslaved children until they were 10 years old. In the 19th century, enslaved shoemakers continued to produce country shoes, while other shoes, called brogans, were imported from north, from the north. Wooden-sold brogans quickly developed a reputation of being so uncomfortable and ill-fitting that former slaves interviewed in the 1930s recollected casting them off, preferring to go barefoot. Slaves must have expended an uh, expended effort at a level that would impress even an elite athlete. It would seem that the health of those who were forced to work on plantations were not impaired by parasites. May there have been some f- item in the diet or something else that might have eliminated or controlled hookworms. And then you nailed it on the head. In fact, uh, the reason why you can have lots of hookworm infection without suffering from hookworm disease is if you are well nourished with regards to iron. And um, it turned out that there was a cultural difference between what the slave owners Go ahead. slave owners um, ate versus what the slaves ate. And what the slaves were fed were basically the tops of plants that the owners were plucking out and... Um, actually eating like turnips and carrots and things like this so the iron rich portion of those plants happened to be in their leaves and uh in fact the um, the people who were slaves in those days were forced to cook in a single metal pot and by doing so the iron in the pot would somehow leach into the food and serve as a supplement for iron nutrition so uh, you're absolutely right that there was a difference between the, the owners of slaves and the slaves themselves in terms of, of how they suffered because uh, these these people had been infected for years without uh, exhibiting signs of anemia. That's the logical explanation as to why they, they were uh, different. All right. Uh, one more. Daniel, can you take that one from Anthony? Experts. Perhaps it would be interesting to hear Professor De Pommier and Dr. Griffin tell what caused the dermatitis in the picture. I'll send a follow-up image with the answer. Background. There's no foreign travel residence or domestic activity in forests or in and around bodies of water. I live in the Washington in the Heights neighborhood of Jersey City and rarely leave the block. What produced the problem could should be obvious to me. Unfortunately, after consultation with Dr. Google with search results pointing to Disney rash, I made a mental wrong turn. What is uh, Disney rash? No idea. uh, Seeing the... All right, so I think you should see the picture there, Daniel. I just pasted it in. Oh, Disney rash or a golfer's rash is a form of vasculitis. Irritation of blood vessel of the lower legs. So he said that's not it, right? No, I don't don't think so. Looking at, you know, I, I wish we had a uh, better, better any yeah. way to get this better but if you if you i'll describe the rash for our listeners this is uh the posterior aspect of a gentleman's uh, leg i think it's the right leg if i'm getting the orientation here so it's the calf and there's a number of erythematous we'll say red um patches about centimeter or more in diameter with a central scabbing area okay Great. it's all through one of them is puritic it looks like and it has a band-aid on one of them below that one oh, i can't see that is that yeah. it's on the, the margin of the leg itself the uh, left margin of the leg mm, where the sock is do you see the sock I don't yeah see I don't there's a band-aid yeah i don't see the band-aid i need a uh, i need a higher resolution my picture. it looks like a band-aid maybe it's not a band-aid <laughs> No, no, I'm imagining a Band-Aid, I think. But there is an open sore above that, about maybe, um, oh, I don't know, a half a centimeter above that. I don't know what did this. Do you guys maybe know? Maybe scratching. I mean, it looks like an infestation of fleas or something. Fleas? I don't know. If they all occurred at the same time, then maybe he ran into a nest of fleas or something. So you want more information? I'd love more information. All right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. That's TWIP160, microbe.tv slash TWIP, Apple Podcasts, or wherever fine TWIPs.
<laughs> wherever fine podcasts are sold <laughs> di- distributed no it's free that's right and if you listen on your phone or tablet on an app please subscribe now if any of you use overcast please like us how do you do that well you go into overcast and you would say go to the twip listing and you see all the twips three or whatever how many you look at at once and on the right there's a little information thing and you you tap that and you get all the show notes and then at the top there's a little star and you just tap the star and if all of you do that in overcast only sounds easy to do it sends us to the very top of uh, their listings and more people will discover us like the gentleman who just found us today and we want more people to listen so please do that and subscribe and if you love what we do please contribute uh, if you can you can do a lot a little as a dollar a month go to micro dot tv slash contribute you can do patreon you can do paypal uh, you could buy a mug and we get a buck from that sale of course that's only one shot deal so we'd rather you do more than that but if you don't want to that's fine but if you'd love to help if you love what we do please do and send your questions comments guesses twip at microbe.tv daniel griffin is at columbia university irving medical center and ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Daniel. A uh, pleasure, as always. Dixon de Pommier can be found at Tricanella.org and TheLivingRiver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm at Virology.ws. Thanks to ASM for their support and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip. Is parasitic.